fly the kite, be the kite that has freedom and expression, but also know that when you let the rope out too far, it can become a very unstable experience. Hello and welcome to the Ultimate Health Podcast, episode 232. Jesse Chapp is here with Marty Wasserman, and we are here on a weekly basis to take your health to the next level. This week, our featured guest is Sarah Wilson. She's back on the show for a second time, and she's the New York Times bestselling author, former journalist, and founder of IQuitSugar.com, which is Australia's largest digital wellness site. Most recently, she published First We Make the Beast Beautiful, a new story of anxiety, which is the focus of today's show, which has been a bestseller in Australia and will be published in the US and Canada today, and in the UK, it comes out in two days. On the side, she campaigns against consumerist waste and enjoys eating, hiking, ocean swimming, not owning very much, and living life light. She has lived out of two suitcases for almost eight years. It was such a pleasure having Sarah back on the show again. If you recall, she was on episode 196 talking about sugar and its impact on our health. And today the conversation is very different and very real, really getting into Sarah's story with anxiety. And I know this is an episode that's going to help so many people. So here's some of what we get into. We talk about how to minimize decision making with routines, how to break the anxiety cycle. And we also talk about normalizing anxiety, which is such an important point. We get into the impact of gratitude and meditation on your brain. We talk about supporting loved ones with anxiety. And the best point of all is that you can still be anxious and have a good life. I loved this conversation with Sarah. I'm so excited for you guys to hear it. Here we go with Sarah Wilson. Hi, Sarah. How are you? Welcome back to the show. Oh, it's great to be back. Thank you for having me. Sarah, it's such a pleasure. You have a new book hitting shelves right at the time of the release of this interview. And we want to wish you a big congrats on that. First, we make the beast beautiful. This was such a fantastic read, and it's going to help so many people. So congrats. Thank you. That's very kind. And I want to kick off by telling an interesting story or having you tell an interesting story from the book. And this is where you actually took three years to buy your first couch. So I just love for you to start (laughs) off by telling us what happened here and what's the story behind this. I'm glad you asked because it actually reflects on something that I raise in the book quite often. And that is the idea of making decisions and how difficult it is when you've got anxiety. And I'm sure some of your listeners would relate. And I found it really comforting to know as a related side point that the decision-making part of the brain is the same part of the brain that controls anxiety. So if you're making decisions all the time, it can actually increase your anxiety. And when you're anxious, like in a panic attack, you just can't make decisions, right? So that was part of the reason I didn't buy a couch. It's just simply because I found it so difficult making a big decision like that. Look, you know, I'm in my 40s and it would seem insane, wouldn't it, that I just can't make a a decision about buying a couch. But I've also worked to very minimalist kind of principles most of my life. I grew up on a subsistence living property and my parents weren't into buying stuff either. And so if I do buy anything, it has to be very, very mindful. I research to the nth degree. I look at buying locally wherever I can. And with a couch, it's such a big investment piece and I wanted it to last a lifetime. So I went down the rabbit hole of researching the most sustainable couch on the planet. I think I found it. I now have it. And what I was kind of interested to learn in this process, somebody pointed out to me, they they saw a photo of me sitting on the floor working. And I lived like that for years, not a stick of furniture. They sent me a picture of Steve Jobs in exactly the same position in the early 90s when he was first kind of creating his you know, empire. He was sitting on the floor as well in almost exactly the same circumstances. And he took eight years to buy a couch. So it seems to be a thing. That's funny. Well, while we're talking about decisions, you talk about something in the book called decision fatigue, where making decisions is like flexing a muscle and over time you're tiring that out. So we only have so much decision power in a day. So I'd love for you to talk about that a little bit. You pretty much summarized it perfectly. And what I point to is, I guess, high caliber or high functioning anxious types around the world have worked out that particularly minimizing decisions in the morning so that, you know, you don't use up that muscle, you know, by the time you leave the house works for them. So your listeners would have heard of a lot of sort of, you know, creatives and writers and entrepreneurs who have morning routines. 
And a big principle behind that is that it's just if you do a routine and you don't have to make a decision as to what breakfast you eat, um, what kind of exercise you do, what clothes you wear, it minimizes the decision making that you've got to make and saves that muscle for more important things so that you don't get to the end of the day, like weakening your ability to make decisions in and around anxiety. It basically triggers that flight or fight response, essentially. So if you can kind of prevent that, it is a really good anxiety modulating tip to routinize as much of your life as possible. So in my case, I very much have a morning routine and not because I'm being virtuous, it's just kind of become non-negotiable. So my big treat in the day is to go and have a coffee in the morning and sort of plan my day. So I sort of have this routine where I have a coffee. Beforehand, I actually meditate and do exercise. And there's none of this kind of, oh, you know, I'd better get my drink bottle and my yoga leggings and my yoga mat. I just get out of the house. I go for an ocean swim. I'll do yoga just on concrete. I just kind of keep it as simple as possible because if I'm going to decide, oh, should I wear this outfit or that outfit, I'll get decision fatigue. So I keep it as simple as possible. I go to sort of one or two cafes. I have the same coffee order. I also, you've probably learned, guys, I don't buy a lot. I can go for a year and a half without buying anything other than essentials. And so it's just because I don't need a lot of clothes. So because I wear the same things over and over again, and that is again to eliminate decisions. So I think it's a really good one. It's a really simple one, and it actually has benefits in all directions. It saves a lot of time. All right. Well, we're touching on anxiety, and this is the subject of the new book and the story of your anxiety and just taking back throughout your life and how this has impacted you. And I just love to hear a little bit about your beginnings with anxiety. So let's go back to the first time you remember experiencing anxiety. Oh, gosh. In the book, I actually sort of point out that when I was about six years old, I was on the bus and uh, my brother pointed out to me. I actually don't remember this story. I should say my brother, who has got the best memory ever, said to me, remember that time we were on the bus and you missed two bus stops um, because of that woman's perfume? And I was like, oh. Now, for me, perfume um, is very much associated with anxiety and a lot of people with anxiety have heightened sensitivity, whether it's to noise, to touch, to smell. I'm very sensitive to smell. So it was kind of interesting to know that at the age of six, the woman next to me had a perfume on that distressed me so much I had to cover my face. He said, you know, you were covering your face. You didn't see the bus stop. I sort of remember seven or eight. My brother suggests I was potentially six when I first started to feel anxiety. And I had insomnia from a young age. At sort of 13, I was diagnosed, if you could call it that, by a counsellor. My dad took me to a counsellor for my lack of sleep, but I was told I had childhood anxiety. And I don't think anyone back then knew what that meant. And in fact, you know, nothing further came of it. And then probably 17 is when I presented to a psychologist for the first time on my own with anxiety. I was having panic attacks. I wasn't sleeping. I was also depressed back then. At 21, I was actually living in the States. I was on a scholarship to Santa Cruz. And I was over there and I was studying philosophy of the universe, which I think would probably send most people into a bit of a spiral. That was when I was first diagnosed with bipolar. I just couldn't even write my name on a piece of paper. And my lecturer in philosophy of the universe came and got me and took me to a psychiatrist at the university. But what is actually really interesting is that when I was researching the book, my publisher sent me this article about quantum physics trying to solve the hard problem. Why the hell are we all here and what's life about? And the guy who was writing about this and whose book was referred to from back in the early 90s was my very lecturer. <laughs> he came and got me and took me to a psychiatrist. There was a beautiful full circle experience there. And something you talk about in the book too, in terms of anxiety, is the cycle of anxiety and how to break that cycle. So for someone who's experiencing anxiety, part of the process of it is being anxious about being anxious. So I just want to explain this and talk about how someone listening to this who does suffer or experience anxiety on a regular basis can work through noticing that they're in an anxious cycle and potentially how to break it. Well, as you mentioned, the anxiety about being anxious. So being anxious about being anxious. Oh, I shouldn't be anxious. And this is not how it's meant to be. And something's going wrong here. And my heart's going a million miles an hour. And I look, something must be dreadfully wrong. And then you get anxious about that. Gosh, why am I fretting about this? This is not how life is meant to be. And down and down you go, right? One of the things I try to point out, and I suppose more have a discussion with readers about, is the fact that 
this is what anxiety is. Anxiety is a biological response to what we perceive as a threat. And so anxiety and all the symptoms we experience are about flight or fight, you know, the elevated heart rate. We lose blood from our head, so we feel dizzy and foggy-headed, all of that kind of stuff, sweaty palms. We're basically getting ready to ward off a saber-toothed tiger or run for our lives. When we start to realize that, when we go, okay, I've got a bit of stress going on, but my reaction, the anxiety that I'm feeling is actually a physical response. What that does is it actually is a bit of a circuit breaker. You just go, okay, that makes sense. There's no need to get anxious about this anxious response. And I have found people that I talk to and and I explain that concept to them, they go, oh, that actually kind of quarters the amount of anxiety that I often feel when a panic attack is emerging. And I guess that's kind of the basis of my book. You know, the title is First We Make the Beast Beautiful and it's from a a proverb and it summed up perfectly what I sort of feel we need to be doing. We need to be having a discussion about the purpose of anxiety instead of seeing it just as a disorder that needs to be medicated or managed That's the discussion, right, in most books these days is how to manage your anxiety, how to, you know, live and cope with anxiety. Well, I'm like, maybe there's some beauty to it. Maybe it exists for a reason. And once we know the reason, we can actually start to work a lot more productively. We can be anxious and have an amazing life. So I guess a lot of my book is kind of highlighting those understandings, those kind of truths, which we've forgotten about because it hasn't been part of the discussion for a good, well, I'd say... 50 to 100 years because, you know, we've been trying to force anxiety into a medical model. And I think that's what's so beautiful about your book is that you really do normalize anxiety. You are a person speaking from your own experience, sharing this very human experience, which I think a lot of people can relate to. And I'm sure you've noticed that, you know, being on your book tour and speaking with people, I'm sure so many people are coming out of the closet, so to speak, and saying, yes, Sarah, this is me. Thank you for being so vocal and so open about it. And something you talk about too is that This uncertainty that we all feel and someone who might be prone to more panic attacks or more of an extreme case of anxiety and, you know, feeling that uncertainty to a certain degree, it's that search for something else. And you allude to this quite a few times throughout the book. And I want to talk about this, this constant need to fill this void that may or may not exist. So let's talk about this quote unquote something else. Yeah, well, I kind of kick the book off with a discussion of that. The book follows a journey of sort of levels of understanding and reflects kind of my own personal journey through it all. A lot of people who've had bipolar or obsessive compulsive disorder, a lot of their experience coincides with something that could resemble a spiritual experience. And it certainly did for me. My anxiety emerged in my very early teens, sort of 12, 13, and it coincided with my search for what the hell life is about. And I was yearning for this notion of the something else. There's something else out there. There's something that I'm not getting. There's something that I need to understand. And I soon learned that there was philosophers and spiritualists throughout the ages that went and tried to understand that. And in fact, you know, psychologists and psychiatrists, Freud also suggested that anxiety is a yearning for something that is almost untangible, but we know it exists. And so we keep reaching and we keep reaching. And I think it is a desire to understand who we are and why we're here. And, you know, some philosophers reflect that anxiety is an awareness of our own death. I think that can get kind of dark and too philosophical. But when I went and did focus groups, so a lot of the book is based on interviewing over 100 people around the world over the course of seven years, from His Holiness the Dalai Lama through to Oprah Winfrey's life coach, Brene Brown, some amazing minds who have all touched that yearning for the something else and who've all been touched by anxiety and kind of get it. I also did a lot of focus groups with anxiety groups, you know, anxiety support groups. And I said to them, why do you get anxious? And we drill it down, down through the layers. And then we'd get to the point of, I don't know what I'm meant to be doing. I don't know what this is about. Like, what's the point? And yeah, I think that existential yearning is very much part of the anxious experience. Now, when we realize that, and that's all very nice to know, but what are we going to do with that information? I think once we realize that, we then can go on a different type of journey. Instead of trying to shut our anxiety up with drugs and therapy that tries to move us into a happy space or any of that kind of, you know, happiness kind of stuff that we've been bludgeoned with for the last 20, 30 years, we can actually start to go, well, perhaps I'm just seeking a more meaningful, deeper, 
more reflective life. And I've found that when I go and start to read texts by philosophers, past and present, and start to read, and when I say spiritual, I don't mean woo-woo and I don't mean religious. I just mean anything that sort of touches that stuff that we can't touch, you know what I mean? I actually feel a lot calmer. I feel this all makes sense. I feel like I've found a little bit of a tribe, you know, and that is also one of my techniques for kind of making your beast beautiful is to study anxiety, study this something else, study what the hell we're here for. And you break anxiety down into a couple of different categories, one being the acute physical panic attack symptoms, and the other being the more chronically anxious, and you actually have a word or a couple of words for this, anxiety spiral. So I'd just love for you to talk about these two different categories and what that means. When I was researching the book, I was getting a little bit confused myself when people were talking about panic attacks and they'd say, I don't know what was going on. It felt like a heart attack. And in fact, there's a lot of people that present to ER thinking that they're having a heart attack, they're actually having a panic attack. And I went and spoke to a few experts, sort of heads of the big mental health institutes here in Australia, but also in the US and UK, trying to get a better understanding of that. Because I remember sort of having that kind of a panic attack in my first year of university. but My experience of the extreme anxiety is not so much just a physical kind of freak out. It's more mental. It's spiraling thoughts. So that's why I call it an anxious spiral. It's like every thought that you could possibly imagine on this planet cascading into my brain all at once. And I'm trying to absorb it, you know, sort of collate it, sift through it. And I just can't. And I go down further and further. And of course, then I have thoughts about thoughts or I get anxious about it being anxious. And of course, that spiral continues. And I asked, you know, is this kind of normal? Is this like, are there two types? And they said, yes, that kind of panic attack is where you experience in your body often happens with people where they're not necessarily anxious all the time. They haven't got what I call anxiety in their bones. And dare I say it, they probably don't have what we like to call these days a diagnosable anxious disorder. But something has happened in their life to cause them to freak out. And so they go into flight or fight response. So they get all these symptoms. They feel like a heart attack if we're not actually out running a saber-toothed tiger. If we're sitting still, they just boil up and boil up and boil up. And we just feel like we're going to combust. And that often happens with people who aren't, dare I say it, you know, experienced with anxiety and know they just don't know what's happening. And then people like myself who've had anxiety in their bones for most of their life and have sort of had flare-ups with OCD and bipolar and all of that kind of thing, I almost witness my own descent. And that witnessing mind watches the thoughts. And then there's another mind that watches all of that. It's quite a different experience, I think. It's something that hasn't really been discussed before. And I suspect you're asking me about it because maybe you haven't heard it distinguished in that way. Yeah, no, I haven't heard it broken down that way. And I want to dig a little bit more into the type of chronic anxiety that you're dealing with and you work through. Let's talk about these thoughts that you said are just overwhelmingly coming into your brain and and you have to deal with. How does somebody go about starting to silence those and work with that in a positive way? Oh, you know, as a kid, I used to think it felt like gravel in my brain, a concrete mixer, just churning, churning, never shutting up. You know, my short answer to your question, Jesse, is like, it's sheer years on the planet. Getting older has certainly helped. And Steve Jobs did a, an address to students at his university a while back and he talked about joining the dots and that as you get older, you get to be able to turn around and look at all the ups and downs throughout your life and the tough times and you can actually join the dots and see that they lead you somewhere. So that's something that I often try to do is to look back and go, okay, that period of intense mental activity and distress I can see that that was about that and it led to that. And that in itself calms me down when the thoughts start to spiral again. Look, I mean, on a very practical level, like I mentioned before, a morning routine is absolutely key to ensure that the thoughts don't build up and the anxiety doesn't flare up. I meditate, as I mentioned. I also create boundaries in my life to the best of my ability because I do tend to have a lot of mania and that's been a wonderful thing. It's enabled me to create businesses, to write at very productive levels. That's something that I've really been able to realize in recent years that the beast has certainly brought me a very beautiful life. It has enabled me to do a whole range of things. But what I've had to do is re-gear my life and look, not everybody can do it. 
And if you're a young person listening to this, maybe think about choosing a path, a career path that enables you a certain amount of flexibility to create boundaries. So I can work for 17 hours at a time and get through huge amounts of work when things are good and there's a slight bit of mania. When I can feel it starting to tip over, I've got to back off and I need to create boundaries. I have to have days where I have to lie in a dark room and turn everything off and shut down. It's just the way it is. Again, it's maturity that's kind of enabled me to be able to see that and to act on it, but also to surrender preferences to make sure I have a life that's set up that way. So people might go, oh, all very well for you. You don't have a mortgage. You don't. Well, yes, I didn't take on those stresses because I know I've got an anxious condition that requires nurturing and doing things in a slightly different way. I've had to build boundaries around my life. And I talk about that a fair bit in the book about ways that you can do that and the ways in which other famous people have done it throughout the ages. Another big one is walking. And I looked into the science on that. Walking and hiking, so walking in nature in particular, has an incredible effect on most minds, most anxious minds. But I can tell you from personal experience, it is my number one salve. When I'm going off the air a bit, I go and take it out on a mountain (laughs) um, or the ocean. Hiking basically is at the same pace as discerning thought. There's a whole range of theories. The Japanese call it forest therapy. They believe that there's enzymes released from the trees that actually calm you. I actually think the movement of walking slows down your thoughts to a pace where you can start to piece them out and they start to form a nice thread. And and so a lot of my thoughts for books and for business ideas come from hiking because I can think through things at a discerning speed. Now we're going to take a quick break from our chat with Sarah to give a shout out to our new, brand new show sponsor, Switch Grocery. We're super excited to have Switch Grocery on board as our new Canadian show partner. And Switch Grocery is amazing. I've actually known the company and the owner of the company for just about a year now, and they are doing incredible things. And they're on a mission to help Canadians, which can be really tough for Canadians to find access to good, healthy food. So their mission is to help Canadians get access and faster access to healthy, innovative foods and products. And what they are, they're an online retail shop with unique foods for paleo, keto lifestylers, as well as diabetics, and of course, all health foodies. They curate really exclusive brands and products and work very closely with these brands. And some of the companies that they curate include Fat Fudge, which is an awesome pack of fudge, cacao fudge. It's fully fatty and really delicious. You've probably seen it online. They carry this product. They also carry Philosophy Superfoods, which includes spreads and protein powder infused with superfoods. They also have live Kuna banana flour, which is an awesome green banana flour. And when you flip the bag over, you will see my face on the back of the bag with a recipe. And they also carry legit bread, which is grain-free mixes for bagels, pancakes, and loaves of bread. These are some of our favorite products that they carry. They also have so many more. So you're going to want to start shopping at Switch Grocery today. So for our Canadian listeners, you're going to love this. There's free shipping on orders, $149 or more. And as a listener of our show, you also get 10% off your order. Go and check it out. Really easy to do. Just go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash switch grocery. Again, that's ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash switch grocery. We're super excited to be partnered together. You're going to love what they're carrying. Go and check it out. Put an order in right now. And now a shout out to our other show partner, Sun Warrior. And the Liquid Light is the product that I'm going to feature today because it is the one product that we never not have on hand at home. And I definitely recommend you guys getting your hands on it. Not only is it something that you can drink first thing in the morning, adding it to your morning water, but I also recommend drinking it before or after exercise. It's a great way to get detoxifying electrolytes and antioxidants, and it just enhances your water. So whatever the quality of the water is that you're drinking, adding a capful of liquid light can just boost it up. So I would say put a couple of bottles of liquid light into your cart today, start consuming it. It can only benefit your body. And as a listener of our show, you get 10% off all your Sun Warrior purchases. To take advantage, go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash SW. Again, that URL is ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash SW. For listeners in the US and Canada, you can bundle your order together, spend $100 or more, and you get free shipping. Go and load up on Liquid Light today. And now back to our chat with Sarah. 
And you've also talked about how when you sleep out in the woods or in the bush, it resets you because you've also suffered from insomnia and how sleeping out in nature really grounds you and helps you sleep. I know. It's ridiculous, isn't it? I can't sleep in a bed, but give me a sleep mat on some rocky ground, you know, (laughs) and I can do eight hours. It's ridiculous. I think it is a lot to do with our sort of limbic system and that part of our brain that is in primitive mode, let's face it, it gets kind of told everything's okay, I'm back to where my body's used to being. The frenetic life of living in a city, it actually recreates the anxious experience. This is something I don't cover off massively in the book, although I realise I actually did without realising it, is the experience of anxiety amongst teenagers. And that is on the increase. Every parent I know is worried for their anxious teenager. And one thing that I've sort of looked into since writing the book, but I actually realise I do cover it off sort of throughout the book, and so a lot of teenagers have found the book very helpful, is that anxiety, I think, for teenagers and young people today is a lot about the anxious experience being recreated by the way they're having to live. So they may not even actually have an anxious disorder, but their body is reacting in such a way that it feels like it, you know, it looks like it, smells like it, feels like it. So the toggling between screens, the being picked up by one parent, dropped off to one activity, off to another activity, the idea of devices, dare I say it, the constant pings and, you know, instant gratification, that is making people kind of replicate the anxious response. And so I think children are experiencing anxious symptoms, even if they're not necessarily anxious at a chemical level, if that makes sense. It's a subtle distinction, but I think it creates an opportunity, doesn't it, for parents and teachers to maybe slow things down, toggle less, stop being so frenetic. That feeds back into going bush or going into the woods. If you're away from all of that, your whole body just relaxes and that flight or fight response is turned down. We 100% agree and I'm so happy you brought this up because Jesse and I made a recent move, well, it's actually a year ago now, that we made a move out of the big city into a smaller city. So not quite the country, but a smaller city, which made all the difference from living, you know, at the corner of where a bus stop and cars and, you know, it was just so hectic. And anytime we go back into the city now, we feel that. Your heart rate goes up, doesn't it? Oh, it does. It does. And you feel it in your chest. You feel it in your head. That's something that we're aware of now, but you are so right about raising kids these days in that life and in that city, I wouldn't have known any differently, you know, growing up that way until I got to experience life outside the city. So getting that connection with nature and with the slow life, quote unquote, (laughs) or slower, shall we say, can absolutely give your body and your mind a chance to reset and recalibrate. Yeah, it's kind of got to a point. And, you know, obviously, a lot of your listeners would know that I wrote a series of books about quitting sugar. You know, I used to say this when I was talking to people about the whole sugar thing is big food governments, they're not going to be acting in the hurry. They've got vested interests in keeping us all addicted to sugar. So let's not sit around, you know, getting angry about that. Let's actually do something about it. You've got to actually take matters into your own hands. And I feel that way about the whole anxious thing. We can sit around going, we've got to change this and devices and technology and all this is making us all very, very uptight. You know, what's going to be done about it? Well, my point is, don't wait for somebody else to change the world. Change now. As you say, you don't have to move to a a Walden-like hut in the woods. You really just need to make small changes. And it might be moving to a slightly smaller city where people have a little bit more time to talk because they've saved time by not spending an hour in traffic. And you can make those choices and it does involve surrendering a few habits or preferences. That's actually a wonderful thing to do. It's a wonderful challenge. We do have to do things like that because otherwise, as I say, we'll we'll self-combust. It's not the way to live. You've touched on devices and electronics and I'd just love for you to stop on that and dig into the impact of these on anxiety and your thoughts on what people might be doing using these to actually distract themselves if they have anxiety. So kind of the full circle with that. Like I said, I think they do recreate the anxious kind of response, like the frantic toggling and rapid speed way that we go about using technology is certainly one factor. But I think the other thing, which is a much broader discussion, is this idea of grasping outwards. So A big part of the way that we live today is about grasping out to a solution, a fix. And it might be, ironically enough, a self-help guru. It might be the latest yoga fad. It might be drugs. It might be alcohol. It might be a new boyfriend, a new handbag. 
that is what kind of in many ways consumerist society has kind of told us is the way to fix things, is reach outwards to the answer. As I say in the book, it's like wrong way, go back. Reaching outwards when we're anxious is actually one of the worst things that we can do, ironically enough. Often we're trying to run away from ourselves. We're trying to run away from the search for something else, the yearning in our guts that goes, you know, there's more to this than just going out and buying a new lipstick. So we're running away from that. We're running away from our loneliness. We're running away from a need to actually sit quietly and face up to something. There's a whole range of things. We spend a lot of our contemporary life running away, grasping outwards. And I think every spiritualist, every deep thinker in human history has talked about the path inwards, that salvation and peace comes when we can turn around and do that very, very difficult walk back to ourselves. So to your point, technology actually makes that so difficult. You know, anything that's addictive makes that so difficult because it keeps us in that reaching out pattern, forever clambering. It's exhausting. I mean, I'm sure your listeners know exactly what I'm talking about. We all feel kind of grotty and kind of disgusting about our addiction to Facebook or Instagram. We actually have to force ourselves to turn our devices off, right, at 8 or 9 o'clock, whatever commitment you've made to yourself. We don't like what it's doing to us. We know it. It's like the sugar issue. We kind of know that sugar is what is making us feel baseline crap. You know, that was a line that I used in my first book. And we run away from it. We run away from it. Eventually, we've got to come back and sit with ourselves and face up to it and be brave. I think technology actually makes that extremely difficult. But I think, again, I think we're going to start to realize we've got to create our own boundaries and not because it's just a nice thing and it's virtuous and you can write about it to your friends on Facebook. It's because it's going to become absolutely non-negotiable. We're not going to be able to hold down jobs, relationships, etc., unless we start to um, take back control of the journey inwards. And you talk about sitting with the anxiety and just being. Let's talk about why this is powerful and the best way about incorporating this. Well, it's funny because we keep thinking that if we rush outwards, you know, trips overseas, trip to the mall, new boyfriend, that's where the answer will lie. That's where we'll find our happy spot. But in the book, I actually refer to being, it was actually a very dark time when I sort of experienced this anecdote that I refer to. I was at a kid's birthday party and it was my friend's son's birthday. Kids everywhere, toddlers everywhere. And I watched this like little two or three year old go and find the the muddiest part of the park. And he or she, I can't even remember if it was a he or she, went and sat in it and there was mud oozing into their diaper. But this little kid was so happy. I called it happy in spite of. I use that as a bit of a visual reference for, excuse my language, but sitting in your your shit. Sit in it, own it, watch it, observe it, and its power starts to dissipate. That's a very Buddhist approach and I totally sign up for it. One other way to look at it, which I sort of explored when I went through a very dark period, is recognizing that when you're not feeling great, sometimes going for a very basic experience and not aiming high is actually the most appropriate place to be. I use the example of going and getting a massage. I used to go and get a Thai massage where they played really bad synthetic music on a cassette recorder. There was a Daffy Duck torn towel on the massage table. I lived in a sort of a red light area. I could hear the prostitutes and drug dealers outside arguing. Like it was not serene, but I actually was able to relax into that space because my expectations were low. And I think when you're anxious, if you try to aim too high, it's going to be a a bridge too far. So I think sitting in difficult times and not aiming too high is actually a really, really smart technique. It's kind of how I operate now. I don't go to any of those tinkle music, white robes, lotus flowers in the pond type massage places anymore because I know they make me anxious. And since we're kind of, and we were talking about practices, I want to get back to gratitude. And I know that this was a big one for you, and it's something that you still incorporate. So let's just talk about the importance of gratitude and how it relates to anxiety. Yeah. Um, Probably it's one of the techniques that I still use. As I mentioned, I went on a big journey for many years trying different techniques and interviewing different people about ways to more broadly have a better life, but it's very quickly drilled down to how to thrive with anxiety and find the beast. And one of the people that I spoke to was John Demartini. 
he kind of talks a lot about the gratitude effect and he shares the benefits of writing a gratitude journal each night where you jot down three things that you're very grateful for. When I was interviewing him, I also I went and sort of investigated the science behind that and there was some science that was evolving that actually showed how that works in your brain. Essentially what it does is it actually allows your brain to observe a congruency. So you see that your wish and what actually happened align and that satisfies something in our brain that goes, you know what, phew, life is working as it's meant to. It's a very big sense of relief when we feel that and we feel this kind of joy come forward that somehow somebody is looking after us, something's got us. And I refer to that thing that's got us, that's holding us as life, the flow of life. Another thing I talk about in the book is taking your grubby mitts off it. So whenever we try to control life and the circumstances and we try to micromanage, we find that it eventually explodes in our face. If we can sit and lightly observe and go with the flow of life, which I know is much easier than said, we can see that this congruency happens over and over again. We start to see there is a natural flow. And I equate it to, you know, a horrible metaphor or exercise I did in year eight, <laughs> year eight English at high school, where I'm on a raft going down a river and I'm not liking the direction that it's taking me for some reason. So I build up these logs in the river to try to divert the course of things. And of course, it diverts it for a while, but eventually the thrust from further up the river builds up and the pile of logs I've created just explodes into the air and the river keeps flowing where it is meant to flow. And my efforts are sort of dwarfed. I think that's a really good thing to kind of get into the groove with, to be aware of, to practice. And a gratitude ritual is really good for that because you start to see, ah, yeah, I've always wanted that. And that happened today. Right when I felt like eating salmon for dinner, salmon was 50% off at the market. It'll be just little things like that. It's really about taking the time to have a discerning look at what's going on to sit in the present. And it sounds like woo-woo language, but all of those things are cliches for a reason. They're just a truth. And other than gratitude, how does somebody begin to give up that control and just start going with the flow? Is there any other easy practices we can start implementing right away? Yeah, well, look, I'll be very honest and say, do as I say, not as I always do, because it is a lifelong practice. And I'm very honest about that in the book. It's not a self-help book where I stand on my pulpit and say, I've been healed and this is what you need to do to fix your life. Apart from the fact I don't want my life to be fixed, it'd be very arrogant for me to sort of put it out there because I don't think anyone arrives at that point. To your question, one of the great practices is to actually sit with uncertainty, to actually observe how uncomfortable you get when uncertainty arises. And Brene Brown taught me this one. She has a ring or an elastic band on her wrist and she spins the ring or flicks the elastic band when she feels anxiety. And what that does is signals to her to go, okay, what am I feeling uncertain about? Okay, uncertainty is good because it means something is going to happen. It means we've got change happening here. So that's a really good practice is having something that triggers you to stop and drop into a deeper way of thinking and to go, okay, uncertainty is good. We're cool. I mean, other practices, as I say, I do the gratitude ritual um, nightly. I do it just as I'm trying to fall off to sleep. I get out and hike whenever I start to feel things speed up and I just get out and it doesn't even matter if it's just sort of nearby, you know, if it's in a park, I just get out amongst trees and I move and that's all I have to do. Everything else falls into place from there. Meditation is absolutely non-negotiable. What I eat also has a big impact. So yeah, I drink coffee, but I kind of am aware when I start to kind of my energy ricochets up into the ceiling, I go, right, we might just have a coffee-free day today, but I don't put too many strictures. I don't sort of say, right, no coffee. That's not going to work. It's too regimented. I just dial it down until my energy starts to drop down a bit and I can create the space where I can do some of those things like reflect witness what's going on. Ah, this is just me being anxious. This is an anxious response. I don't need to get anxious about being anxious. There are other things that can also get you out of a rut because I know that some people experience anxiety more as a depressive experience. This was uh, from Gretchen Rubin who she wrote The Happiness Project and she's run, you know, written a bunch of um, books since. She sometimes just sleeps at the other end of the bed because a small change like that will just refresh your thinking enough so that you wake up in the morning and things look and feel a little bit different. 
just simple things like that actually do work. It's an incremental change. We've grown up in a culture where we think these big, slapdash, bombastic moves will change things. It's not. We need to move at a discerning pace because that's the human speed. We've got to be gentler with the way we do things. Talking about sleeping on the other side of the bed reminds me of what you chatted about a little bit earlier, sleeping in a tent and changing things up that way and having a better sleep. So maybe there's some of that involved in your tent sleeping as well. Oh, absolutely. And look, that's not for everybody. This is another thing that I do. It's actually quite unique to the manic experience. I need to have an outlet for a bit of risk and a little bit of mixing things up. So sleeping in weird places. If I'm in a manic state, it actually is a great place for me to go to because what it does is it actually gets me back to almost a prehistoric state of fending. And one of the reasons they say exercise obviously really helps with anxiety is it's an outlet for that flight or fight response, all the chemicals that build up. Part of the reason that we get panic attacks is because those chemicals build up and there's nowhere for them to go. Previously, we would do a quick sprint across the savannas, you know, and up a tree or something. Whereas in our life, we kind of freeze. And so those chemicals build up. That's why getting out and fending, sometimes I'll just go down to, I live near the ocean and I'll go and clamber over some rocks or I'll jump off into a dangerous part of the ocean. And don't try this at home, children, but I'll often just go and introduce myself to strangers. I just have to express that buildup of almost Neanderthal-like survival, you know, mechanisms. For me, camping out in the woods, it's kind of a way for me to get in touch with that, if that makes sense. It's an outlet for my need to sort of, yeah, fend. You touched on depression there. And just to clarify the difference between anxiety and depression, can you give us a little overview of how they differ? Yeah, um, I've heard this sort of reflected on by a number of people. Both anxiety and depression are very much about a reaching outwards away from ourselves. You know, as I said before, it's like, we run from ourselves. And so for the anxious, it's often about grasping into the future. The anxious tend to fret about what's about to happen and whether they have all the contingency plans lined up for whatever may or may not happen. It's a hyper awareness of all of those contingencies. So it's a very future orientated experience, whereas depression tends to be a past sort of orientated experience. So depressed people can often lament or regret what happened or over-ruminate on a discussion from three days ago. And it's often about looking backwards. So they're quite different, I suppose, but the solution is, or the salve or the kind of more expansive way of viewing it is to go, all right, increasingly, if we can find ways to come back to ourselves and come back to the present and to where things are at, like legitimately at, then that's a much better way to go about things. And I remember Eckhart Tolle talks about this. You know, he says, What's your problem in five minutes? Okay, what's it in two minutes? Is there a problem in 30 seconds? Is there a problem in five seconds? And then is there a problem right now? And when you do that exercise, framing it to whatever issue that you might have, you suddenly go, no, right now there's not a problem. And that's probably been the best explanation for me as to why living in the present, you know, all cliches aside, why it actually works. It's just quite frankly the truth. I want to get back to food a little bit. You alluded to coffee earlier, but I want to talk a bit more about the diet and how food and for sure sugar and something you know a lot about, how it plays a role in the anxious cycle. Give us a little bit of perspective on how certain foods can trigger anxiety and also what foods specifically ground you and keep you calm and focused. Um, Marnie, I'm glad you remind me of that because that was one of the techniques that I was going to mention when I was answering (laughs) Jesse's question earlier, but I got sidetracked by myself. Food is actually a really important part of it. And many people who followed the I Quit Sugar journey uh, know that the reason I did it wasn't to make a business out of it. It was because I legitimately needed to find a better way to eat to manage both an autoimmune disease and my bipolar. To me, they're kind of almost the same condition in the sense that they're both about inflammation. So anti-inflammatory foods are kind of the thing that I gravitate towards. And I gravitate towards them now naturally. It's not like I'm on a diet. It's on an effort. It's just the way I eat. Sugar was the number one culprit. We now know that it's the number one culprit in terms of turning up inflammation. And as a result, it's linked to a whole range of illnesses, metabolic diseases such as obesity, type diabetes, Alzheimer's, pancreatic cancer, all these kind of very contemporary diseases. But there's also a very big link to 
bipolar and OCD and a bunch of other sort of anxiety disorders. And that's because, you know, we now know that anything to do with the head comes from the gut and the gut brain connection is well and truly understood now. You create inflammation in your gut, you create inflammation in your brain. So the kinds of foods, obviously less sugar, gluten inflames, it triggers that inflammatory response in a lot of people. Look, if you've got no health concerns, you can handle gluten. So don't go on a carb-free diet. But if you do have inflammation issues, cut back on the gluten for sure. In terms of foods that actually help probiotics, and I say this because I've actually just written an anti-anxiety ebook that's available on the, all the various ebook stores. It's a two-week plan. I basically based it only on the science that's you know either gold standard or very close to in terms of nutritional science and probiotics, fermented foods, they are fantastic for ensuring that the bacteria in your gut is fired up and can combat any inflammation that starts to kind of take off. So they've even found that a tub of yogurt can actually have a very big difference on depression sufferers. They've done quite conclusive studies on that. And look, yogurt is not the best form of probiotics, but it in itself can make a difference. I really suggest getting into making things like sauerkraut, kombucha and other fermented foods. They're dead simple. You make a big batch. They'll last you three to six months. And really, you add a tablespoon or two to a meal or two a day. That's pretty much going to be your fermented kind of quota. It's simple, simple, simple. The other big one is turmeric. And I know turmeric is very fashionable in the States at the moment, but for good reason. It is a rare so-called superfood, which actually has a lot of science behind it. The effect on inflammation is really substantial. And I, from my own experience, find that. But there's a couple of caveats. Turmeric to be beneficial needs to be fermented preferably and eaten in the presence of a good quality fat, avocado, olive oil, coconut oil, and it also needs to be in the presence of either cumin or black pepper. I know that sounds very specific, but that's what the science shows, and that's easy enough. We mostly eat turmeric in a beautiful curry with coconut milk and some black pepper in there. Leafy greens are also very beneficial from a whole range of standpoints in part also because of what they do to our liver. They release bile, which balances out stomach acid, et cetera, et cetera. So they're the kinds of foods. And tryptophan via meats such as turkey and eggs. It's really amazing, isn't it, how every bit of uh, nutritional advice ever given for any complaint really comes back to the same old things. Eat mostly vegetables, good quality fats, and a bit of meat protein. That's kind of the deal. Now we're going to take another quick break from our chat with Sarah to give a shout out to our show partner, Perfect Keto. One of our favorite products from Perfect Keto is the MCT oil powder. And MCT stands for medium chain triglycerides. And this is a powder that you can add into smoothies or elixirs. It gives it a creamy, frothy texture. And it's also giving you mental clarity and focus. It just helps you feel really good. This is something that I'll put into our smoothie or elixir first thing in the morning. And it carries us throughout the day. And we feel so on point. And I like the plain. You can also get the vanilla or the chocolate, whatever floats your boat. They're all delicious. They're all amazing. I would keep it on hand. And if you don't have them yet, add it to your cart today. As a listener of our show, you get 20% off your Perfect Keto purchase. To take advantage, go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash perfectketo. Again, that URL is ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash perfectketo. The product ship worldwide, free shipping in the US. Go and take advantage right now. And now a shout out to our other show sponsor, Raw Elements. And one of my favorite products from Raw Elements is the Lacanto. And Lacanto is a sweetener that comes from monk fruit. And it comes as a granulated powder in golden or in white. It also comes as a maple syrup. So these are products you can have on hand, especially if you're living a low sugar lifestyle. And you are going to mimic sugar in all the right areas. So whether you want to add this into smoothies, elixirs, baked goods, or pancakes, I love using the maple syrup on pancakes and it's still sweet but not too sweet and you don't have that impact on your blood sugar levels. So get your hands on Lacanto and give it a try. As a listener of our show, you get 10% off all your raw elements purchases. To take advantage, go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash raw elements. Again, that URL is ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash raw elements. For listeners in the US and Canada, you can bundle your order together, spend $100 or more and you get free shipping. Go and load up your raw elements cart right now. And now back to our chat with Sarah. 
All right. Well, I'm excited to hear about your new ebook, and we're going to link that up over at ultimatehealthpodcast.com along with everything else we're talking about today. So listeners, be sure and go check that out. And Sarah, you touched on meditation. And I want to talk about this from a couple of different perspectives. First being, how important is this in your routine to keep your mental health in check in a general sense? And then how important is it if you're going through a bout of anxiety? Is it something that you'll meditate more during these times? Or what does that look like? So if you're a really seasoned meditator, um, meditating through a very rough, anxious period can work. But in the book, I actually really acknowledge that when your anxiety is, you know, spinning around and you are off the air, meditation can actually make some people more anxious. And that's certainly been my experience at different parts in my life. Sometimes it can become yet another thing that we grasp out to, you know, which then takes us further and further out away from ourselves, which makes us more and more anxious and on and on it goes. So we've got to be practical. Sometimes something as, you know, pious and wonderful as meditation is not appropriate when we're in a full-blown panic attack. So there's other things that you can do. And I talk through some breathing exercises, which sound really boring, but they're pretty simple. But I actually think one of the best things that you can do, and it combines the breathing exercise element as well as the meditation element, and that is to go for a walk. When I was um, in my 20s and I didn't really know how to meditate. In fact, every time I went to a meditation class at some university thing, I would end up in a panic because I I just couldn't do it. And so that just made me feel even worse. But what I had, it was a little sign on the back of my door that said, just walk. And I would just put on my shoes. I would just walk out the door. And even if I just walked for 20 minutes in one direction and then 20 minutes back in the other direction, that would be enough to calm me down. And I sort of talk through the science in the book that shows that that in itself actually dials down the chemical response in our brain. You don't have to do anything else. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to concentrate on it. Just walk. So that would probably be my form of meditation for when you're really in a really bad anxious spot. Don't try to be perfect in those moments. However, meditation is a daily practice to prevent you from getting to that place where anxiety becomes unproductive because most of my book is about actually viewing anxiety as productive and as helpful and as beautiful and as the catalyst to incredible creativity throughout history. I mean, some of the most incredible poets, scientists, you know, politicians, writers, artists have had crippling anxiety. And it's the anxiety that has been the very kind of grist to their meal. You know, most of the book I'm talking about, work with your anxiety, understand it, see it as a beautiful thing. We also at the same time need to have practices so that it doesn't spin out of control. And, you know, I use the analogy of a kite. We don't whoop up and start, you know, violently jerking around on the, the string, you know, fly the kite, be the kite that has freedom and expression. But also know that when you let the rope out too far, it can become a very unstable experience. So meditation is one of those things that brings the string in a little bit closer. And I love how honest you are in the book by saying that you're crap at meditation and just the mere intention of sitting with yourself is an act of self-care. And I think that's so important for people to hear is that there is no good or bad. There just is. Just sit, do it, be with it, be with yourself and practice whatever form makes sense to you. So I just want to acknowledge that. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Mani. And it's a really important point. Meditation will work. Like, don't worry about it. It will work even if you crap at it. And it's also the same philosophy I apply to the anxious journey. Just keep going along the path. It's the journey that matters. It's not about, I don't know, getting to an end point where, right, that's anxiety done, you know, because that's not what makes for a characterful, meaningful, rich and worthwhile life. I've got 85 years on this planet. Most of us do, give or take. Do you want to have a sanitized life or do you want to have a life that's got lots of shades of colors and textures? It isn't about obliterating. It's not about being perfect. It's not about rounding out all the edges. It's about just making sure that we don't let it spin out of control to a painful space. And Sarah, as someone that's dealt with anxiety for the majority of their life, How important do you think this has been to all the success you've had? You've grown this monster brand and you're just doing so many big things in the world and having such a big impact. Do you think a lot of this is due to the anxiety or what role does that play? Oh, the two couldn't exist without each other, to be honest. 
my anxiety has seen me be highly productive and it's also seen me dig to the depths of you know the human experience at times into incredible darkness which has enabled me to understand where people are coming from when they experience the pain of an addiction to sugar or whatever it might be i also think that it's made me care i'm motivated not by money i'm motivated by trying to kind of get us all conversing on a similar and joyous song sheet. Now, that wouldn't have existed if I was sort of, you know, happily trotting along the conveyor belt without having had any reason to fall off it and see another way. And, you know, I went down to a very deep space in my mid-30s, I think I was 34, and I describe it in detail in the book. It was a suicidal moment. I had a moment where something just clicked. I'd gone down as low as I could go. I temporarily made the decision I was going to opt out of life. I'd hit a cul-de-sac in the end point of my descent. And when I hit that point, I suddenly went, oh, well, hang on. Actually, I've got an option here. I've got one option. And that is I can either die or I could actually choose to do it all very differently with just the clothes that are on my back. Because quite frankly, at that time in my life, I had nothing else but that. I'd lost all my belongings. I hadn't been able to work for a year. I was very, very sick. And so I just went, all right, well, let's see what happens. And out of that stemmed a kind of disregard for money and sort of, I guess, the status quo (laughs) and doing everything by the rule book because I started from a point of zero and I realized I could just choose my own adventure. And that's a choice I made. And look, I've got to be honest, guys, like it's a daily practice to remind myself of that commitment. So if I hadn't gone that low, if I hadn't experienced the depths and the darkness I wouldn't have made that decision to do things differently. And that enabled me to run a business with the freedom of not being wedged into an Excel spreadsheet. I made decisions based on what felt right at a time when nobody knew what was going on. It was right at the beginning of all the social media stuff. Twitter had just been invented. Nobody knew what they were doing. And so I made up the rules myself. I would say that's probably one of the biggest benefits that my anxious experience has contributed to what I do. And I tap into it still. I say this in the book, once you've touched the something else, once you've just had a glimpse of it, it might be for a split second, you don't forget it. You can't unsee it. You can't unlearn it. And you want to keep going back for more. And so it very much steers me towards wanting to to create and also create without the limitation of thinking, oh, uh, will it make me money? Because I actually don't care. And I'm just curious, what's it been like releasing this book, being so vulnerable and open and sharing your story? Was it what you predicted? Did you get the response that you were maybe expecting? Like, how has that been? Oh, that's a really good question. I didn't know what to expect. I just put the book out. And in fact, there's whole slabs of the book I don't even remember writing. Like people will recite it back to me in an interview or on the street. And I'll go, did I write that? Once the book came out, I then was able to just go, all right, now start the next stage of my life. And I've got to say, it has been way better than I could ever have imagined. I say this at the front of the book. My mate Rick says to me, you know, why are you writing this book? Why are you disclosing your entire life? And I said, oh, because I'm lonely and I'm bored and I want to have a better conversation. So I'm going to go first. I'm going to start the conversation, the conversation I want to have with people and let's see what happens. Because I was really at a point of deep, deep loneliness. Loneliness, not from lack of people, but lack of a type of chat that I really needed to be having. And so since the book's launched here in Australia, and obviously it's coming out in the US at the end of April, it's just been much more fun. Like the conversations I have with random strangers all over the place, a farmer traveled 15 hours to see me talk at a conference. And he wanted to tell me that, you know, he'd been estranged from his daughter for three years. And he read the book and he finally understood his daughter and they've reunited. And then another couple came up to me in a bookshop and said, oh, we're getting married next week, but we were broken up six months ago after being engaged for a year. But we both read your book and the woman had extreme anxiety and insomnia and OCD. And she said it helped. Probably the most rewarding part of the conversation that's been happening is the loved ones of anxious people. I've been just so heartened by how much they want to better understand their anxious wife, husband, sister, uncle, whatever it might be. Like people are desperate to understand this better because they don't want to just put it down to, oh, there's a chemical imbalance in their brain and they need to take medication. 
we all know there's a bigger discussion to be had. And at least in my circle, that discussion has been happening and it's made for a much more enriching life, I can tell you. So I'm really looking forward to having that conversation in the States as well. You talk about the loved ones, and I'd love to dig into this a little bit. As being somebody who's gone through anxiety and had the support, I'm sure, of loved ones, friends, different people in your life, what's been the best way people have supported you throughout this? It's a really good one, and it's a really important thing that we need to talk about because I didn't realize the extent to which loved ones just feel powerless. They don't know what to do. So a couple of things that I share in the book, one of them is to make decisions for us. So if you have a friend that's having a panic attack or is in a bit of a whirl, the worst thing you can do is say, oh, what do you want me to do? Or what do you want for dinner? Or should we go and see a movie? The worst thing you can do is to try to get them to make a decision because like I said at the very beginning of our chat today, the decision-making part of the brain is linked to the anxiety part of the brain. So when we're in an anxious spiral, we can't make decisions. And if you try to make us make decisions, we get more anxious. And quite often we go into either flight or fight or a freeze state. And that's certainly what I tend to do when I'm put in that position. So a few of my friends know this. And when I'm in a bad way, they go, right, dinner is at six. You're going to come over and then we're going to watch XYZ on Netflix. You know, we'll see you in half an hour. They'll make the decision for me. And I don't care at that stage what we do. I don't care if it's not the movie I want to watch. I just feel safe. And somebody has decided what I'm going to do for the next two hours. And that's usually enough for me to recalibrate and get back on my feet. I think the other thing is sometimes just to sit there. You don't necessarily always have to provide advice. If we know that you're just sitting there and you're kind of cool, read a book, whatever it might be, just being there does help. I mean, that sounds quite a soft um, tip, but you don't have to do too much more than that. And then I guess the final thing, this is a really good thing to discuss. I explained this to somebody once and a light bulb went off for me and them. I explained to them that when I'm anxious, I often seem controlling. I often seem to be controlling my boyfriend or a family member or a work colleague. They get pretty annoyed and upset about that. I said to this person once, look, I'm not trying to control you. I know it looks like it. What I'm trying to do is control the situation so that the triggers that can send me into an anxiety spiral don't happen and then I you know, don't ruin the scenario. If we're sitting on the couch and I've got to go and ask them to, could you please you know, just do this for me? You know, I really am not wanting to control them. I'm just trying to control the situation so it doesn't spiral and I don't then ruin our evening together or our lunch together or whatever it might be. When people see that, they go, oh, you're not attacking me. You're just trying to fix the scenario. Cool. I'll help you with that. And there's less defensiveness. And that I think has helped. It certainly helps me and the people around me, but I think it's helped a lot of couples as well. Thank you. That's really helpful for, I think, a lot of people listening. And Sarah, in wrapping up, just to give perspective, where are you at right now with your anxiety journey? Oh, it's certainly still very bumpy. Um, I watch it, I observe it, I go through it. I don't necessarily always love it, (laughs) you know. It can be very painful. I have periods of mania, which can sometimes feel like I just do not have control of this runaway train, you know. But like I say, I generally go into the woods and hike, just sort of throw myself at a mountain. I also have to annoyingly observe myself taking on too much when I'm having a manic period. And then, of course, it all comes crashing down on me and I find it very hard to cope. And, you know, the two of you have been very understanding with me today. I've had one of those episodes (laughs) uh, where I take on too much and I it swells. I get caught up in the whirlwind of it all and I don't always have kick in the coping mechanisms in time. I think the difference though now is that I can just observe it and not get caught up in that story and feel that that's all I am. I allow myself to be anxious and to have a good life. They're not exclusive at all. And in fact, if anything, I think my anxiety is what very much has led me to having a very, very good life. So that would be the difference. And releasing the book and having conversations like the one we're having now, I'm the luckiest person in the world because I get to practice it and be held accountable to all these techniques I share in the book because I have to talk about them all the time and they're wonderful reminders. But it's merely a conversation, right? I'm alive to it and I don't get caught up in it as the only story to my life. Well, Sarah, you've put together a fantastic book. Any listeners out there that are dealing with anxiety or if you know somebody dealing with anxiety and you want to have a better understanding of it, gift this book to them. 
It is a fantastic read. You've put so much into this and you've just been so real and so vulnerable. And I know your message is just going to touch and help so many people. So thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you very much to both of you as well for getting what the book was about. And it is very much something that I think is worth giving to others. It's a gift book, really. (laughs) It's a beautiful book. The cover is, do you want to just speak a little bit about the cover of the book? Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to. Um, That took two years of research. My couch was three years. The cover was a process of literally going around bookshops around the world to some of my favorite uh, bookstores in in New York City as well, literally touching fabrics and textures on books. I wanted it to have a moleskin feel. I wanted it to have a companion type vibe. There's an octopus on the cover that my partner, during the time that I was sort of writing the end of the book, he created for me. It's a Japanese art form called Jiotaku and it's a beautiful octopus which sort of signifies a mysterious scary beast throughout mythology yet when you understand how intelligent they are and the weird things about octopuses you start to go wow they're incredibly beautiful. It's a great sort of motif I suppose but yeah like I said the fonts, the textures, the thickness of the paper I researched for many (laughs) <laughs> for way too long probably and then I've designed the book so that there's columns on either side I don't know if you noticed that but I put my own notes in there as I go along but I also created it so that people can write their notes as they go along and it's really incredible I don't even give an instruction manual for that that's what everyone does as soon as they get the book they start scribbling in the side notes and they add their own layer of understanding and discussion so there's a whole heap of little things like that that are really important to I think, the feel of the book as you read it. And a lot of people took six months to read it and it's a whole heap of chapters. So I'd write things in little spurts so that you can read, pause, reflect, you know. So, yeah, some people have taken six months to read it and that's, I think that's lovely. I think more discernment, more reflection in life is a good thing. Well, so far we only have the PDF, so we can't wait to get our hands on the hard no, copy. We haven't touched We haven't the actually fabric. touched okay. it yet. No, not yet. <laughs> It'll happen. And seeing the very hot, lurid pink inside cover and, It's got, yeah, the bubbles coming up from the octopus are a a spot fluoro and then it's got a silver foil, all of which I very carefully put together. I hope all of you over there enjoy that sort of tangible holding your hand experience as well. Can't wait. So the book is First We Make the Beast Beautiful. And Sarah, other than getting a copy of this fantastic book, how can the listeners go and connect with you after the show? Oh, well, you mentioned it before. There's the anti-anxiety diet little two-week plan, which I think is 99 cents on all the various Amazons, Barnes and Noble, etc. at the moment. I'm also at sarahwilson.com. That's where I blog. My Instagram is Sarah Wilson. You'll find that pretty easily. And I, I share a lot of my hiking adventures and also my various wellness techniques there. It's not a very um, filtered, smoothed out kind of experience. I keep it as real as I can. So I do try to keep the conversation going. That was part of the commitment I made when I wrote the book is I try to converse as much as I can. So yeah, sarahwilson.com or Sarah Wilson on Instagram and on Facebook. Keeping it real on Instagram, keeping it real with the new (laughs) book. Love it. And Sarah, we're going to link everything up over at ultimatehealthpodcast.com. So listeners, be sure and check out all the links. And Sarah, we just want to thank you so much for coming back on the show. Round two was a blast. And this was awesome. Thank you. Oh, my absolute pleasure. And thank you for being very, very understanding and compassionate. I really appreciate it. Our pleasure, Sarah. Thank you so much. This could very well be one of our favorite episodes today. Such a real conversation with Sarah. And we hope you guys got so much out of it in relation to anxiety. Maybe you're going through anxiety. Maybe someone you love or that's in your life has anxiety. And we know this episode and certainly Sarah's book can help. And something you guys can do right now to show some love is take a screenshot of your phone listening to this episode. Tag Sarah Wilson and at Ultimate Health Podcast. Let us know what you think of the show and keep listening. Thank you, guys. Before we let you guys go, I want to give some love to our editor and engineer, Jason Sanderson at podcasttech.com. Jace, thanks for doing such a great job with the show. And this week's fun fact about Jace is that his favorite exercise right now is just walking. And I can totally relate. I love walking. Right on, man. Listeners, have an awesome week. We'll talk soon. Take care.